Welcome to The Confidence Interval, an occasional podcast from the MRC Epidemiology Unit at the University of Cambridge, talking science, people and public health. We're using this podcast to explore the research happening at the MRC Epidemiology Unit, meet some of our researchers and find out what makes them tick. I'm Oliver Francis, Head of Communications for the Unit, and with me today is Dr Jean Adams, Senior University Lecturer in Dietary Public Health Research. Jean works as part of the Centre for Diet and Activity Research, or CEDA, which is led by the unit. Jean, in fact, featured on the panel discussion that was in the last episode, Improving Our Diets, More Freedom or More Control, which should give you something of a clue about what we're going to talk about. Now, I get the odd phone call and email, and they see the word diet in CEDA's title, and they want to ask me about how to lose weight, or whether chocolate's good for us, or carbs are bad, so on and so forth. But that's not what dietary public health is all about, is it? What's it about? Um, Well, the work that we do in CEDAR as part of the Dietary Public Health team is looking at um, things in our environment that influence what we eat and how we might change people's environments to make it easier for for them to eat better. So we're we're not the nutritional epidemiology team. They work out whether specific nutrients are good and bad for you and whether what foods we should and shouldn't eat. We kind of take that learning and say, okay, then how can we make it easier for people to eat that stuff? And there's something about when you say make it easier, there's sort of levels that things are easy. You know, it can work for an individual, it can work politically, it can work for society. And you talk about a trade-off in your work between effectiveness, equity and acceptability to use the kind of posh terms Mm -hmm. for it. So just picking up on this word effectiveness, because, you know, what the what works thing, because it, it's not as simple as it might sound, because there's a kind of fashion in policy circles to talk about what works when we think about dietary policies. But what we know works for me might be different from what works for you or someone else with very different backgrounds or experiences. So how do you square the need to find out works for different people with finding something that works for whole populations? Yeah, so that's an interesting question that really gets at the heart of the public health approach, maybe, that um, in public health we think about populations rather than individual people. So we're not clinicians, and in clinical medicine and other um, clinical specialties, maybe like um, dietitians or nutritionists, it's really important for them to do their job well to engage with individuals and understand what what a specific person sitting in front of them needs but in public health we think more about groups of people and what we can do to help um, people in general in general so what we can do to shift whole populations dietary patterns so what would an example be of that i mean a a diet a population dietary pattern doesn't doesn't sound like what i have for my dinner yeah no it doesn't and we think about it in terms of i don't know how many of the population are eating five a day or how many uh, what proportion of the population are managing to achieve the target for not eating too much red and processed meat or things like that. So we do think in terms of um, percentages of the population who are doing something rather than which specific people are doing something. But like we're not, we're not m- always massive scale and we recognise that the characteristics of people and the characteristics of where they live and um, what their neighbourhoods are like, those can influence their diets in in big ways so it's there's there's a kind you're right there is a kind of a funny point at which um we're interested in individuals but not particular individuals like we're interested in individual characteristics i guess so in that context what might an effective intervention look like to change (laughs) to change people's diet well an effective one would look like one that actually changed their diets (laughs) (laughs) so but the sorts of things that um people do are um like you've seen this stuff change for life adverts you know those little morph characters who are dancing around and saying you should eat more uh eat less and move more but the other sorts of things that are happening at the moment are more focused on food labels to let people know what's in their food and provide them with easy indicators of whether foods are i don't know high in fat or high in sugar and then the sorts of things that we're interested in are really changing the um, affordability, affordability, the availability of food. So that might be things like um, taxes on uh, sugary drinks or changing the proportion of takeaways in a local high street or um, 
we did a study recently looking at uh, supermarkets removing the sweets and confectionery from their checkouts. And so none of that's uncontroversial. Um, I'd say we probably get more, uh, there's more debate around our dietary work than, than and mm-hmm. many of our other areas of research. And one of the, these ideas about what we do is what's acceptable. And this idea of acceptability is a pretty fluid concept, isn't it? Because sometimes I think we forget how quickly what is acceptable changes, how societal attitudes change, how political attitudes change. Mm. Is your research just involved in finding out what people think is acceptable or is it involved in changing <laughs> changing what they think is acceptable? Yeah, so we have done some work on acceptability and then as soon as you mentioned that, the next kind of really academic question is acceptable to who? So there are lots of different groups who may have different opinions and even like even within society, but then uh, something might be acceptable to the population, but not acceptable politically or vice versa, or acceptable to public health people who are asked to deliver interventions, but not acceptable to um, the people who receive them. I mean, yeah, the reason that I'm interested in acceptability is because I wonder whether we can manipulate it. Um, I'm not sure that I have... Is, is manipulate the right word? <laughs> well... Well, sometimes I think it might be, yeah. I I guess we have some interventions that we know to be effective in changing people, what people eat or people's behaviour in general, and that aren't deployed because they're, uh, well, one of my stakeholders, in a a steering group, one of the stakeholder members once just said to me, because they're a bit yucky, it's just not nice to do things like uh, ban crisp sales. Like we, that would just feel really strange. That's not the sort of society we want to live in. Although that would be a really good way to stop people eating crisps. So sometimes I think that it might be that we have something that works and one group of people thinks okay, particularly if the population thinks it's okay, but we have to help politicians understand that that would be a good thing to do as well. So sometimes I think it might be understanding whether it can be manipulated. Maybe... As a researcher, it's not my job to manipulate anything. It becomes quite quickly political, small p and big p, doesn't it? Manipulating people's lives. Um, And there's a lot of ideology and opinion in this area about what we should eat, how we should eat, what's healthy, what's unhealthy, um, how much the state should have a role in saying what our daily lives should be like. How do you protect the science at the heart of all this opinion? Yeah, so I guess... I try and see a difference between um, making the decision about whether we should do something or whether we will do it and me providing the evidence of whether it might be a good thing to do. So I guess I feel that we live in this world where um, well, we live in a country where we're concerned about the NHS. That seems to be a kind of a, a, a common thing and part of the problem with the NHS maybe or the challenges it's facing is um, growing prevalence of obesity and diabetes and other things that are related to diet and so uh, all political parties or well the mainstream political parties have all made commitments to trying to tackle those things so it seems to me that we've made some sort of democratic choice that we want that to happen that we want to address these issues And so then it's my job to help people understand how that could happen. And if at the end of the day, the political party that's in control chooses not to do that, then that's their business. It's not my job to say they made the wrong decision because those are the people we've chosen. Hmm. Because you gave um, evidence at the um, House of Commons Health Select Committee recently, didn't you? What what was that like? (laughs) Well, it was nervy, actually. (laughs) There's lots of things about that that environment that I find um, interesting. Like the the building is both beautiful and falling down, and that seems uh, kind of bizarre. And to walk past the chamber is so exciting, and you feel like, wow, this is really the heart of it. Although there's a guy with a gun at the door, so you can't even put your nose to the glass. And to sit in front of those people where you thought that this is where change happens is a real privilege and very exciting. And yet I found the process 
almost slightly mundane. They were clearly, the MPs around the table had clearly been fed questions by some sort of level of civil service and not, like, few of them seemed to have gone through any thought in the MPs' head that they were just reading out questions they'd been fed and they didn't necessarily engage in debate. They were just eliciting information and kind of nodding and saying that's right. And there was something slightly um, anticlimactical about that, I think, that I want... It was like, maybe you're Vira, you want to really have a good chat about it. I think we're probably um, used to uh, the the image of the select committee where the, the politician is grilled, which is the one we see on television. Yeah. And I think that when I prepare people for these um, these sessions... You you have to remind them that you're not you're not there in an adversarial context because they're not trying to catch you out. They're yeah. actually it's an it's an inquisitorial context. They're trying to find out what you know. Do do you think that um, you know we talk a lot about people don't always have the right decisions to make the right the right information to make the right decisions about their health? Do you think there's just a lack of information in political circles? Do you think they just don't know enough, or is it is that the is that the only barrier are there other things that stop them making them what you think would be good decisions so so sometimes i do think that that um you know there's big churn both in civil service and in politics and that almost means that we have to um skill people up repeatedly like we're repeatedly having the same discussions with different people because the person we had that last chat with has moved on and that that does seem to me a problem but that could be addressed in a, in a generic way of um, talking about these things in, I don't know, in school or at university or somewhere where uh, more people would have access to it, I guess. Is it? I don't, I think it's not necessarily a, well, I don't know, is it a lack of information? I think that public health is a way of thinking rather than necessarily a bunch of facts. That definition of it is the science and the art of preventing disease and promoting health. So one of the um, concerns in the science and art of <laughs> public health um, is about creating better public health for everyone. And e equity we talk about um, mm. in public health as a, as a way of, of reducing inequalities in public health because some interventions can help people who are already well off and make them better off but not help other people. Now you trained to be a medical doctor, that's right, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yes. So Michael Marmot, who is also a medical doctor, um, who's very concerned with the inequality at the root of many of our health problems, mm -hmm. he talks about seeing patients, patching them up, sending them out again to face the conditions that were making them ill in the first place, and having a moment where he realised he was kind of working on the wrong scale. Did you have a moment like that? I didn't know that about Mike Marmot. Um, I sort of did. Probably I didn't articulate it quite as well as he did, but certainly I had a moment in... Well, I was always interested in the more social stuff all the way through medical school, um, and everybody else kind of sniggered when we had social science lectures, and that was the stuff that I really loved. There was a moment in my final year, I think, where I was doing an eight-week rotation on a general medical ward, and in that eight weeks, we saw a lady... Um, with uh, chronic lung disease admitted three times and every time she came in and we gave her antibiotics and we gave her some oxygen and she got a bit better and we sent her home and then a couple of days later she had some other crisis and she was admitted back in again and the reason she was sick was that she'd smoked all her life and I couldn't believe that no one else thought the solution here is to stop this woman smoking or to stop people like her 50 years ago smoking and that just kind of drove me mad that that a life of a doctor could be to deal with problems that could have been solved a long time ago. Mm. And that's that's an interesting d distinction, isn't it? Because actually, at the point that she's ill and has been smoking for all those years, it it might be too late to change that behaviour. Yeah. And because that behaviour will exist in a in a context of where she lives and her relatives and her you know house and home and all those other things that might have mm -hmm. led her to be a habitual smoker, you, you want a time machine, don't you? You want to kind of go back in time well, exactly. for those patients. And that's why it's really hard to say doctors are doing the wrong thing. They're doing exactly what they should do for the patient presented in front of them. But, uh, I, but I think, like as you've described about Mike Marmot, it just seemed to me that 
really the big change would happen if we stopped everyone smoking rather than we let them get really sick. It's really horrible to have chronic lung disease and just to exist in a place where you can't quite catch your breath. You, you talked about changing the person's behaviour and, and, and so it comes back to the individual, doesn't it? And it's, it's quite hard in, in population health to not look at the individual because that's how we think about our own lives, our own behaviours and our own ability to change or not change. And there's something you've written about, about agency, which I think is really important. And my, my experience is that a lot of my friends and relatives and people I know who, who don't work in this field seem to think that, and actually many other people who, who have a professional interest in this area mm -hmm. have this view, that if everyone has equal information, we're kind of back to information mm. again, they'll, they'll be able to make equally good decisions. But is that, is that really true? when it comes to behaviour change and what do we do about it if it's not? Yeah, and the kind of follow-up of that is that if they don't make good decisions, then it's their own fault. And so then we start kind of blaming people for their own um, ill health. So our work um, focuses on the things around us that shape our behaviour that are not information, I guess. That it's can... So there's lots of information, for instance, we were talking about smoking, that... A really high proportion of the population get that smoking is bad for you. They might not get the details of particularly what disease is, but that smoking is not good for your health, I think that we can take as read. And similarly with diet, that people have a general sense of what's good. Fruit and vegetables are good, cake is bad. Like, not the details, but um, the, the general. And yet... Um, and yet people, our population in the UK and globally, is not eating as well as they might. And that suggests to me that information is not the only thing that's important here. And that work that you described, um, in that we propose that it can be hard for people to enact uh, the information that they have to make use of it if they live in, a, a, in an environment which makes that hard. So, for instance, if um, we give someone a, a leaflet saying you should eat more fruit and vegetables. Uh, they have to be able to read that first of all. So they have to be able to process the information. They have to be able to remember it. They have to be able to not just remember it short term, but access it next time they're buying food. Uh, so it has to be there at the right moment. And then that means they have to be able to uh, afford the fruit and vegetables if they're, when they're in the shop. They have to know how they might use them to make a meal that's... Uh, palatable and acceptable to not just themselves but the rest of their family and um, then they have to keep doing that so there's and they have to have access to a nice supermarket to begin with that has a stock of fruit and vegetables that they like so there's all sorts of things that can get in the way of information leading to behavior change and that's it's that stuff in that gap that really interests us is how can we change that environment that people are having to enact that information in to make that easier mm. and i'm going to pick you up on a couple of words because i think they're interesting in terms of how we talk about this area you you said that fruit and vegetables were good and cake was bad and i know <laughs> I, didn't, you I said people generally people get generally that. get that but i think that's it's interesting isn't it that morality and food yeah, yeah, are very yeah. closely connected yeah, and yeah. we and in, particularly in a lot of the political discourse, there's a there's a sort of moral judgment in, engaged yeah. in what people eat and what people, particularly what people feed their children. Yeah, yeah. And how do we get beyond that? Because I my feeling is it's not productive to kind of link morality and diet because you, it feels like you judge people. Um, it, it feels like there's a you know a surefire way to get them to change their behaviour is 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 certainly not to, to make, make them, them feel, feel ba rubbish. bad about themselves. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Well, maybe it is, but what, what do you think? I mean, do you think that is helpful or unhelpful? No, I think it's really, really unhelpful. Not least because I also like cake, and I don't find it useful to um, feel guilty about that. It's just life seems too short to worry about eating cake too much. And so that, like, even for me, I think... It would just be better if it was harder for me to eat cake. I don't want to have to worry about um, putting the biscuits on the top shelf and making sure there's always fruit in the bowl. I, I, I kind of want it just to be 
I'm hungry, I go into the kitchen, there's an apple. That's the obvious yeah. thing. I didn't want to have to worry about making it the obvious thing, which is what I do. And I think the morality thing is, a. I think it's driven by this idea that we all have experience of food because we all have to feed ourselves. We all have really in-depth experience of this issue. And um, people who are slim and eat well it's really hard for them not to say, yeah, that's because I'm good at it, because I'm good at um, making good choices. Because I sometimes wonder this about um, decision makers, that they are often high agency people with education, with um, resources. Exactly. And, and th- they control their own lives. It's really because, easy for them, yeah. Well, certainly relatively easy for them because, they, you know, in, they'll, they'll vary in their backgrounds and experiences too. But I think that... It's, it's hard to say this, I think, without sounding patronising, because that's the other difficulty, isn't it? Because I suspect you think that personal responsibility is important, that if you want something, you need to work for it and achieve it. So <laughs> yeah. why is it different for you, for you than for the, the people that are, um, whose lives are affected by poor diet? Why, why do, the, do you not give them the credit you give yourself? Yeah, so that is true, and I, I sometimes worry about that as well. But I also... Um, have enough insight into my own life to see the stuff that is making it easy for me and like it's not that I don't like even I think well you know the reason I'm a healthy weight is because I put quite a lot of effort into going for a run biking to work having fruit at every meal although that and that glosses over the fact that I like cake and we have that like probably most days there is some like pastry <laughs> biscuits things right so I am sort of um seeing my life through rose tinted um uh, glasses but also I see my life I guess as it is I'm uh my partner and I together have a household income that puts us in the top five or ten percent uh we both have extensive education, uh, like more than a couple of degrees each. And we don't have to make decisions about um, affordability at the supermarket. We just buy the stuff we want to buy. And that that is important to remember that that makes us unusual. Hmm. We, are, we are not normal people. And therefore, the way we run our lives is not normal. Yeah, normal is a is a huge a kind of huge well, kind not, of worms maybe it's up, not it? usual yeah you're right that I, I guess it we comes, have many luxuries yeah and it comes back to that question about what what's a population when we're changing populations how who are we talking about and and sometimes the the interventions we make for the whole population actually only hit a small segment of them because of the nature of the the levers that they pull yeah yeah and that's why uh, there is no magic bullet. Lots of different things will help different people, and so you have to put a whole bunch of things together to help everybody. Yeah. So you, you're. It's quite clear you're passionate about um, about this area, and I think it's interesting to to find out what motivates scientists, because some scientists are kind of driven to change the world. Others just like the process of inquiry. Do you have a feeling of what kind of scientist you are, a mix of both? <laughs> so I've spent quite a lot of time wondering about this question. Um, of what's my motivation for this? I'm not always convinced that I am that passionate about it. And we talked about judging people about what they eat. Often people, when they find out what I do, they kind of take a step back and they're either a little bit shocked of, oh, well, then you wouldn't want to know that I had this you know, I had a bag of sweets for lunch or, oh, you'd be really pleased to know that I had cocoa nibs on my cereal. I I don't care either way. <laughs> I'm not that interested and I know enough about is what it, influences diet. To... Is it like being a doctor and having someone show you their rash? It's the equivalent now that <laughs> people want to tell you what they have for breakfast. Yeah, or they want to not tell me or they suddenly feel judged by me. Maybe it's being like a psychiatrist. Everybody mm. feels like their innermost thoughts are suddenly known. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I do feel a bit like, you know, kind of eat, eat what you want, by the way, it's probably not, you, you're probably decision making is not having much influence over it. It's all sorts of other things going on that are influencing you. Um, I th- so, you know, I think what really bugs me is that we talked at the start about um, 
politics and democracy. Of this, I, it, it bothers me that we have elected uh, successive governments who have made commitments to change uh, health inequalities, to change uh, obesity, diabetes, to make efforts to uh, really change the dial on those things. And then they release policies. So those are things that as a society we've sort of bought into because we've elected those governments. And then they release policy that I know is not going to achieve the aspiration that they set. And that feels, well, it seems a bit stupid, but it feels hypocritical to me to say we're going to do this via this mechanism that I know does, is not going to achieve that target. And I think that that is what I'm really passionate about but but do you also recognize that perhaps like you they're trying to balance equity effectiveness agency yeah 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 political so, they're, yeah. they're trying to do and this ideology kind of... and all that stuff but then then don't set that target if if the sort of stuff you're willing to do is uh not going to achieve the target don't lie and tell me that you'll achieve that target so looking forward um are there any kind of frontiers in your in your area of research you're trying to push? What's what's kind of next for you? Where where do you where do you go? Having you know entirely solved this problem that we've been talking about <laughs> for the last few minutes about all these conflicting um, um, yeah. influences. Do, don't you think that loads of scientists are, love the fact that their problem will never be solved? <laughs> like that they kind of say, "Oh yeah, I'm going to solve this problem," but at the back of their mind, they know they can't, and therefore that's what gives them a career. Quite right. possibly. I, <laughs> I used to work. Going. I used to work in the NHS, and there was the 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 problem was solve this problem yesterday, and yeah. here it's solve this impo impossible problem at some point. Yeah. So it's a different kind of impossible. In a couple of generations, yeah. yeah. Um, but do you think we are making progress? Do, 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 or is it a entirely quick, <laughs> quixotic correct. struggle? Demonstrably, we are. Like um, there are um, improvements in population dietary patterns in the UK, and um, there's some evidence that. At least the prevalence of childhood obesity is stagnating. It's not getting worse. So it seems to me that we maybe are making progress. People are living longer, like um, people are living healthier lives as well. So I'm sure, um, you know, having having um, saved the world with your science, uh, you've got some spare time left over. Mm -hmm. And um, what what do you do to wind down? After uh, all this uh, public health. <laughs> yeah, so it's a bit of a cliche that all um, dietary research is like food and cooking, so I do like food and cooking. I like, I really like, in a generic sense, um, making stuff. Uh, it kind of engages a different part of my brain and requires my hands, so I do a lot of um, things like knitting and sewing, and I make a lot of my own clothes and furnish our house, and recently got into gardening as well, which kind of feeds into my... Um, cooking thing and obsessively try and work out how I can make at home all the products that one would normally buy at a supermarket and then realise that it's easier just to buy them at a supermarket but it was fun to do the process. Uh, so that I do that so the stuff I do in the evenings and weekends. Um, in the holidays I'm in the mountains and I... You sound like you have you live in a hut up a, up a hillside. <laughs> yeah, Is yeah. It in the mountains. No, I no any mountains. We go to whatever mountains uh, are, are right for the circumstances. But I really I love skiing. Lots of different types of skiing, walking. I have been into climbing at times. I just really love being in the mountains. And, and the you space. Have, you have a particular interest in scalping certain things, don't you? In scal <laughs> scalping. <laughs> Well, well, we've disagreed about whether one should do this before or not. I have climbed all the Munros in Scotland, which so there, these are hills in Scotland over three thousand feet. Um, well, it's it's so ridiculous; it's not even clear if it's every hill. But there is a list of two hundred and sixty something hills that um, one climbs and then can become a, a Munroist. One is called, and I have done that. Um, I finished a couple of years ago. My partner's not quite finished. He's got two more to do, which we'll do this summer, we hope. So you're doing some of them twice, presumably? Yeah, I've done many of them <laughs> twice. Quite a few of them three times. But after that, I think we really... You know what? It was just a really easy way to do holidays for a long time. We didn't have to think about it. Um, we have just... Uh, well, last weekend we bought new bikes. We're picking them up this weekend. New touring bikes. So that's the... New exciting thing is to 
well, he thinks we're going to France, but I think we're going to Scotland on our bikes. Sounds like quite a lot of physical activity. Are you, are you ever tempted to uh, change your research area to physical, physical activity? I've done some physical activity research. Um, kind of, no, I'm, I am really interested in food. Physical activity researchers are, you know, I always think they're all elite athletes. Maybe they think we're all like professional kooks, but I feel like I'm not in that league. Dr. Jean Adams, thank you very much. Thank you.